Hi everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach. This time I want to focus on the BTEC assignment unit 9 which is called Human Regulation and Reproduction. There are three learning aims to this unit and learning aim A is the one that looks at the interrelationship of the nervous control of the cardiovascular and the respiratory system. This video is also relevant for A-level biology students as I'm going to talk a little bit about the intrinsic and the extrinsic control of the heartbeat which is something that you guys do in the second year of your course. This is specific for AQA, but I'm sure it will go on to the other exam boards as well. There are actually a number of videos that I have already created, and that's on a playlist on my channel that are relevant to this unit and for A-level students as well. So if you just click on the link that's just flashed up on your screen, you can access them all and see which ones are good for you guys to learn from. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the intrinsic control of the heartbeat. The word intrinsic actually means internally controlled or influenced internally. And this animation over here on the right shows you how the heart beats and some of the key components that you need to be aware of are labeled on the left. Firstly, I want to point out the SAN or the sinoatrial node. So I'm specifically looking at this point over here. Now, the sinoatrial node actually gives the heart its amazing property of being myogenic. That means it can contract on its own without the need for any external nervous stimulation. And that's quite a key word that you need to be aware of. The heart, when it's removed from the living body, will continue to beat as long as it's supplied with glucose and oxygen. And the sinoatrial node doesn't require impulses from the nervous system to initiate electrical impulses in the heart tissue. It's therefore known as the pacemaker of the heart. The SAN is in the wall of the right atrium, as it's shown on that diagram on the left, and it's basically a mass of specialized muscle cells. The next key feature I want to highlight to you is the AVN, which is shown by this particular red blob over here. This is at the base of the atrium and kind of just before the opening between the atria and the ventricles on that side. The green lines on this particular image show you the path of the electrical impulse. So if we just talk about how the electrical impulse will travel. The sinoatrial node will be the pacemaker, as I said, and that will initiate the contraction of these walls of the atria, so both on the right and the left atria. And as those walls contract, that basically will build up pressure in the atria, will force these valves open and will allow blood to exit from the atria into the ventricles below them. The impulses also then reach the AV node, but there is a slight delay in the AV node firing its contraction. And the reason for that delay is because we need to allow the ventricles to completely fill, the atria to completely empty before the ventricles can contract. So what happens is the AV node will send an electrical impulse down the center or the septum of the heart. Now, in the septum of the heart, you've got two bundle fibers, or the, sometimes they're called bundle branches. So you've got the right bundle branch and the left bundle branch, and together they're known as the bundle of his, his with a capital H. And the electrical impulse basically goes down the septum along the bundle fibers, or the bundle of his, and eventually towards the bottom of the ventricles, where they will then transfer onto what we call Purkine fibres, or you might see it spelled as Purkinje, and I'll show you the spelling of all of these in a second. And these electrical impulses, when they reach the end of these bundle branches and eventually onto the Purkine fibres, will initiate the contraction of the bottom of the heart through the apex that will basically force the blood from the right ventricles into the blood vessel leading away from the heart and from the left ventricles into the blood vessel of the aorta. So that's kind of what this animation here is showing. Essentially, this squeezing over here that you can see on the right and the left over here shows you the SAN node firing and basically allowing the walls of the right atrium and the left atrium to contract. As that happens, the blood will pass onto the right ventricle and the left ventricle respectively. And then the AV node here will fire and will send the messages down the septum through the bundle fibers and over to the Purkine fibers, which will cause this contraction here. And in the time that it's taken me to explain this, this has been happening about 60 to 70 times per minute. Um, and so what I think is easier to look at, and certainly something that's going to be quite crucial for you guys, is to be able to 
describe the intrinsic regulation of the heartbeat. So again, I've got a couple of animations here. Certainly the bottom one is slowed down where you can see kind of the firing of these um, bundle fibers and, and the firing of the SAN node and the AV node. But I've also got the verbal description here of what you need to know. So feel free to pause the video right now and give yourself a chance to write down these six key points with the correct spellings of the key words that you need to know. So the next thing that we need to understand is that the rate at which the heart beats is actually modified by nerve impulses from two areas of the brain. Right now, as you're at rest, the SA node is firing at uh, your resting heart rate. But what you need to understand is that there's um, impulses from two areas of the brain that our heart can receive. One of the areas of the brain is known as the cardio accelerator center, and the other area is known as the cardio inhibitory center. And both of these are actually located in the medulla oblongata of the brain. And neurons from here can basically carry nerve impulses to the sinoatrial node when needed. So this is where we talk about the extrinsic control of the heart. This basically means coming from the outside. So essentially, we're talking about external factors that may have an effect on our heart rate. I always use the example of seeing a big scary dog in the park that would make my heart beat a little bit faster. But equally, you could also think about activities such as exercise that can also increase heart rate. So we've got this image here showing you the control centers. We already know that the pacemaker of our heart will set the basic rhythm of our heart rate, but this rate is actually influenced by the cardiovascular control center, primarily in response to sensory information from pressure receptors in the wall of the blood vessels entering and leaving the heart. The main trigger for changing the basic heart rate is the change in blood pressure. The responses are actually mediated through very simple reflexes. And the first thing I actually want to talk about is the receptors that I've just mentioned. So there's actually two types of receptors that you need to know about, chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. Now, receptors, as you know from previous topic areas, are actually sensitive to chemical changes or pressure changes as well. So the ones that are sensitive to chemical changes are known as chemoreceptors. There are actually two patches of chemoreceptors in the walls of blood vessels, and these are sensitive to the chemical composition of the blood. They're located in the aortic body of the aorta, just above the heart, and the carotid body of the wall of the carotid artery in the neck. At both of these sites, the receptors are sensitive to carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. And some textbooks might also talk about pH as well, because as carbon dioxide concentration increases, the pH of your blood actually decreases, going to more acidic. Another set of receptors called the baroreceptors are actually sensitive to blood pressure. Baroreceptors are found in various blood arteries, but also are particularly concentrated in the carotid sinus, which is close to the carotid body in the neck. These are actually stretch receptors. The higher the blood pressure, the higher the frequency of nerve impulses to the medulla in the brain. And these receptors basically form part of the negative feedback system that prevents blood pressure from getting too high. Essentially, what I'm saying here is as the blood pressure increases, the baroreceptors are stimulated because there's more of a stretch in your blood vessels. Now, the medulla oblongata part of the brain, as I mentioned earlier, has this cardio inhibitory center and the cardio accelerator center. The inhibitory is responsible for bringing down our heart rate and the accelerator center does the very opposite. So this particular slide um, of my video shows you what happens um, to stimulate and increase the heart rate. So again, the letters and the, the heading where it says M1, that's more relevant to the BTEC, but certainly the A-level and the BTEC students will need to know exactly the same information. So for this particular area, what we're looking at is what the chemoreceptors will detect and what the baroreceptors will detect. So both of the chemoreceptors and the baroreceptors will communicate and send impulses to the medulla Impulses produced by the cardioaccelerator center will pass down the sympathetic neuron to the sinoatrial node and the AV node or the AVN in the heart. The impulses arrive at the ends of the sympathetic neurons, and that, that will stimulate the release of a chemical messenger called noradrenaline from the synapses. Now, noradrenaline will cause the sinoatrial node, or the SAN, to increase the heart rate, and that also increases the strength of each contraction. Basically, the more impulses that are sent to the SAN by noradrenaline will basically increase the stroke volume and speed up the heart rate. And this is how our heart rate will increase. 
The opposite to that is obviously the decrease in heart rate. And again, we're still looking at chemoreceptors and bioreceptors. But this time we're looking at the impulse being sent to the medulla oblongata, but specifically produced by the cardio inhibitory center. So impulses produced by this center will pass down the parasympathetic neurons to the SAN and the AVN. And when these impulses arrive at the ends of the parasympathetic fibers, they stimulate the release of another chemical called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine causes the SAN to reduce the rate of the heartbeat and inhibits the transmissions of the impulses by the AVN. So the actions of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic fibers are therefore antagonistic. By increasing the heart rate through the sympathetic pathway, we can also then decrease it by the parasympathetic pathway. So just to kind of summarize what we've covered, there are actually two ways to increase the heartbeat either by sending more impulses down the sympathetic neurons or sending fewer impulses down the parasympathetic neurons. Obviously, the converse will slow the heart rate down. And overall, the heartbeat is adjusted by the changing of the balances of the impulses down the sympathetic and the parasympathetic neurons. I hope that was super useful for you all. Please let me know if you've got any questions or comments by leaving them under the video. I've also linked other relevant videos in the description of this one. So just scroll down and watch the other related videos if you need a quick refresh of your knowledge. Thank you so much for watching as always. Bye for now.